Hello, everybody. It's um, my pleasure to present to you today results from our mesigdamide uh, CC92480 plus uh, dexamethasone study um, in relapsed and refractory multiple myeloma, which we presented at the American Society of Hematology in New Orleans. My name is Dr. Paul Richardson, and I serve as the RJ Corman Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and the uh, Director of Clinical Research and Clinical Program Leader of the Jerome Lipper Myeloma Center at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, Massachusetts. And it's my pleasure to present on behalf of my co-investigators preliminary results from the dose expansion phase um, of our uh, CC92480 MM001 trial. Now, just by way of introduction, uh, mesigdamide, or MESI, as we like to call it, um, punning obviously on the outstanding performance of Mezzi in the World Cup, um, but actually we picked that nickname before that, so it's a, it's a happy coincidence. But suffice to say, CC92480, or Mezzi, is a novel potent oral cerebral E3 ligase modulator, or so-called cell mod, which has enhanced tumoricidal and immune stimulatory effects um, compared to other similar drugs, although they are in a different class, such as the immunomodulators. And what we know is that preclinical and translational data support the fact that MESI has a distinct difference, not least of which, because it's designed to target maximal degradation of key proteins called Icaros and ALOS, which leads to not only increased apoptosis in myeloma, but above all, immune stimulation. Now, it induces this by engaging in a 100% closed active cerebellon state in the cerebellon E3 ligase complex. And we illustrate that on the uh, slide here, I'll just use the pointer to, to make the point where this binding by the molecule is complete and it's 100%. Whereas for a comparison for immunomodulatory drugs, which are smaller molecules, um, this same effect um, is much less. It's around 60%. So, uh, or between, I apologize, between 40 and 60%. Um, so in that context, preclinically, there is synergy um, with dexamethasone, proteasome inhibitors, and anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies preclinically with mesigdamide. But this study obviously was focused uh, in the setting of just monotherapy, using it with uh, the drug itself, combined just with low-dose dexamethasone um, given on a weekly schedule. Now, in our phase one, two trial, we established a recommended phase two dose of mesigdamide with this wonderful convenience of a three week on, one week off schedule. So one milligram given daily, three weeks on and one week off. And when you combine it with uh, dexamethasone, as I mentioned at low dose, 40 milligrams once a week for younger patients, 20 milligrams weekly for patients aged 75 or over. We saw in this that we actually generated a 55% response rate in um, this particular cohort as part of the phase one study. And the purpose of the expansion cohort was to look at this in a larger number of patients and establish um, the efficacy signal and tolerability. Now in this dose expansion cohort, we allowed patients to have three or more prior lines of therapy. Above all, they had to have relapsed refractory disease, which constitutes an exquisite area of unmet medical need. And they had to be triple class refractory. And importantly, we allowed patients who had had BCMA exposure to participate. Now, the primary endpoint of our evaluation was overall response rate, but key secondary endpoints included duration of response, safety, and progression-free survival. An important part of the study was exploratory too, looking at the pharmacodynamics um, of the combination on tumor cells and in patients. Now, in terms of the baseline characteristics, these are summarized here. We enrolled over 100 patients. The time from initial diagnosis, the medium was around seven years. Importantly, in terms of age, we enrolled patients um, uh, up to the age of 85. The median age was 67. And as you can see here, we were enriched for high-risk features, extramedullary disease in 40%, and high risk cytogenetics in almost 40% as well. Now, in terms of prior therapies, you can see that 100% of the patients were relapsed and refractory, 100% of them were triple class refractory, and approximately 30% had been exposed and or were refractory to BCMA treatment. Now, in terms of patient disposition and treatment exposure, I summarize that here, but in the interest of time, I think it's fair to say that very few patients discontinued due to adverse events. This was outpatient treatment, and there was minimal treatment-related mortality. And importantly, in that space, there was actually only one patient who passed from complications of COVID-19. So this was an important observation. Similarly, when we looked at treatment emergent adverse events, neutropenia was the most frequent hematologic grade three or four treatment emergent adverse event, but infections were the most frequent 
in the non-hematologic space, but nonetheless proved manageable and relatively low overall. So in terms of the infection profile, it's important to note that we saw overall um, uh, a rate of uh, infections that were grade one, two in almost two thirds of patients. But the important infections such as pneumonia only occurred in 22% of patients and COVID-19 in 17% of patients. And then as you look at this side, you can see here critically um, that in terms of serious infections, um, these were relatively low, only 13% um, in fact, overall in the grade three category and just 3% in the grade four category, which I think is very important to note. And then as you look here at the other side effects that we observed, essentially fatigue um, was perhaps one of the more important, um, as was um, obviously um, some uh, uh, diarrhea, um, but again, relatively low rates of infection and low rates of other non-hematologic side effects um, for this uh, oral combination. In terms of the diarrhea, which can be sometimes such a challenge um, with um, lenalidomide, for example, we saw this in about 30% of patients, but it was all grades. But fortunately, only in three patients was it considered grade three or, or serious, and in no patients was it grade four. So I think as we look at treatment emergent adverse events and look at the tolerability of mesigdomide, we were encouraged by the relatively low numbers of non-hematologic uh, toxicities that we saw. And above all, we didn't see thrombosis, we didn't see cardiac signals, and we didn't see neuropathy. So all important side effects to bear in mind, um, in especially in such a vulnerable population. Now, what about response rates? Well, we were very encouraged by this. 41% of patients by intent to treat had uh, um, responses, PR or better. Encouragingly, um, we saw, in fact, very good partial response in a significant number of these patients. And at the same time, we even saw complete responses, recognizing that these are patients with highly um, resistant um, disease. If one looked then at patients with extramedullary disease, it was a response rate of 30%. This was particularly noteworthy. And then similarly, if we looked at those patients who were exposed to BCMA, it was remarkable, although recognizing the number is relatively small, that we saw 30, uh, in these 30 patients, we saw a 50% response rate. Now, how did this translate into progression-free survival? Well, I think it's important to note here that the data are early. And in this context, we have a median progression-free survival of 4.4 months, but that again is, is, is an early uh, estimate. And we expect that to improve with maturity of data. Duration of response, I think, is a little bit more helpful here. And in that regard, you can see for those patients who achieved very good partial response or better, we saw a median DOR again with relatively short follow-up of nine months. And indeed, for those overall, we saw a median du duration of response of almost eight months. Now, very interestingly, in terms of the pharmacodynamics, this was a fascinating part of the trial. We were able to demonstrate that mesigdomide clearly is pharmacodynamically active in patients who were refractory, not just to lenalidomide, of course, but most importantly to pomalidomide, or in fact had received pomalidomide in their last regimen. So what you can see here in this slide is that we've got the patient at screening with significant upregulation of ALOS in their disease, and yet despite being refractory to POM, when they are exposed and after seven days of mesigdomide, you can see this dramatic reduction in ALOS uh, expression on the cells, telling you that you're actually reducing um, the tumor ALOS uh, expression dramatically. And this in turn is re resulting in a treatment effect. And when you look then in the peripheral blood, for example, NK cells, T cells, and so forth, you can see that there is a promising and positive signal um, from the drugs, uh, sorry, from mesigdomide uh, in this population. So in conclusion, um, we see that mesigdomide is a potent novel cell mod with a differentiated preclinical profile from other agents. Importantly, mesigdomide and dexamethasone had important clinical activity in this very refractory population, 41% response rate. And this was particularly noteworthy because we were able to see responses in patients who had had prior BCMA exposure and extramedullary disease. I think what's so encouraging, though, for an outpatient therapy, all oral, that we saw a manageable safety profile. And for example, we saw only one COVID-related death in this large cohort of patients, which was enrolled during the height of the pandemic. And importantly, in terms of non-hematologic treatment immersion adverse events, these were manageable and relatively uncommon.
Importantly, as we go forward, mesigdomide is being combined with other standard therapies as part of large ongoing trials, both in the phase one, two and phase three settings. So um, these, I think, are, are very exciting new developments going forward. But we're very hopeful that this body of data in and of itself um, provides substantial uh, hope uh, and, and promise for patients going forward. And in that spirit, I want to especially acknowledge our patients and families who made the study possible, as well as our study teams at each of the participating sites, our sponsors, Celgene BMS. And as we move forward here, just to really acknowledge this was a real world international study group. And what we have here are participants from Australia, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, Finland, France, Greece, the United Kingdom, Spain, Korea, and of course, the United States. Thank you very much.